No. Uh, my name is Ellen Wood, and I'm the regional coordinator and the chairperson of the coordinating uh, committee for Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario Kairos. And uh, I would just like to gather us uh, together. And, uh, and we are on Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 territories. And this is the ancestral lands of the Cree, Dakota, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, uh, Ojibwe Cree, and the Denny Nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, I think Debbie is going to uh, um, give the gift of tobacco and introduce our elder. Okay. Um, yes, Marge Rosselli is our um, elder for all of our sessions, and we're very grateful for that. Um, she comes from Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation, and uh, has just retired. So we want to congratulate her on, on that. And Marge, I just want to present you, um, I don't know if you, there it is, um, with the tobacco as a gift for you in recognition of your sharing, your uh, learnings with us and being with us tonight. Um, Marge is available to anyone who um, feels uh, a need to talk things over with someone during our, all four of our webinars. So if anything is of concern or triggers for you, um, you can chat Marge um, in, the, in the chat box and, and she'll give you some support. And we Thanks for being with us, Marge. We also have some elders uh, joining us from Kenora. And if there are other elders who are joining us uh, after Kenora introduces their elders, if you could just identify yourself. Um, that would be helpful for us. So Yvonne or someone uh, in Kenora, could you introduce your elders there? They seem to have gotten disconnected. I don't see her anymore. So okay. maybe we'll try again after a bit. Okay. Um, I will ask Marge to uh, open our meeting with a prayer or whatever she feels is appropriate for us. Yes, thank you. I wanted to welcome everybody to this session and we're going to be talking about uh, the food forest and restoring the land and the land has always been very important to my people, all Indigenous people. We, we have a special connection to the land and I'm interested in hearing this presentation and I'm very pleased to be here and to hear, you know, the different presentations and to see the faces from all over and to welcome everybody to this session and I'm very happy to be here and I'd like to uh, say a blessing because it is our, our belief that whenever we have a gathering of any type we start with the presentation of the tobacco which I accepted and very thankful to have the medicine to uh, to bless the meeting with, but also I have um, some sweet grass here that we use to bless and bring good energy. Last uh, session we had, I used sage, and sage is a, a cleansing that we use to uh, to drive out the negative uh, energy to cleanse. And so this time I'm using uh, sweet grass to smudge, which is a blessing for everyone, a blessing for this uh, gathering. And I'm gonna ask the creator to give us guidance and to give us understanding and to let us feel that connection to the land, to all living things. And uh, when we say at the end of our prayers, it means that we are all related and we grow up believing from the teachings of our elders and our parents, those that are important in our lives, that we are all related and how one is affected affects the others. So we need healing. We need good energy, you know, um, so that we can be healthy. Our old people always said that we wait for winter 
to bring the snow and the cold. And uh, it says that if it's not there, then we have a makoshija, means there's an illness upon the land. And so we pray and we smudge and we try and restore the balance. There's always a balance of, of all things. And all things are living the way we are taught because means the things that move. They say everything, stones, you know, the rocks, the land, everything has uh, a life to it and it moves. And so we grew up learning those teachings and everything we do, like when we pick tobacco, we offer, uh, pick medicine, we offer tobacco. And where there's a gift, we return we return it with a gift. So I want to uh, start with the prayer for guidance and for blessings and for the speaker and for the ears and the hearts of all to hear and understand. And I like to say that in my first language, uh, the Dakota. Some people call it Sioux. Uh, we prefer to call ourselves Dakota, meaning a friend. So Ata wakanta ka amakbe kitana kechi. Amakata hitu ga machinchosh, wayam kichab mate. O haitu kide wana we kudi egi chan, o manichu yo happy. Unkama kochi yo hada kapta mini wi choni hana. A tanku apki hana wokakta wokakne hoyakoba. O chante tawachinkta kokakne bastriuma. O hana tukata ki hong hi apka. A makochi ka kewa shtekta. O hechir, o shiche hoi, chiche, o jigje runto, o shon kirabie, haitu a kama uche, o mitad mena o banik tacha, siu chasta makasa tomi. O shon kirabie, o shon kirabie, o ya kaba uchoi kena, ya kukto shi ek, o na kuk, o ha uyam tuto kaki. Hechir o shiche hoi, chiche, o kanta. Um, I believe the elders from Kenora are online, and uh, if, if Yvonne could introduce them. Uh, yes, hello, it's uh, Kathy Lindsay. Uh, we're just uh, heading now to the center, so we'll be hopefully on the on the, on the joining you uh, in the meeting fairly soon. Okay. Uh, we have Kathy. My name is Kathy Lindsay. Uh, we have uh, Tommy Hunter and Margaret Hunter. Tommy with Tommy Hunter. Tommy Keese. Yeah. <laughs> Margaret Hunter. <laughs> and we're from the Treaty Three area. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, you guys. Um, Welcome. And me. Big watch. Carrie, Carrie, do you have anything to add around technical stuff? That uh, I know, I noticed that we added a survey uh, component. If you just maybe highlight that. Um. Yeah, I don't know if we're planning to use the survey or not. Maybe that's something we could talk about. But um, my name is Kerry. If you do have any tech concerns um, throughout any point, I may be able to help. I may may not, but feel free to chat with me privately. Um, and just to say also, we'll um, be taking questions primarily through the chat. So if you have any questions throughout and want to just start putting them in uh, and or comments, feel free to do that. Um, and then we'll, after the presentation, then we'll take the questions that way. Um, yeah, and also let you know that we'll be recording this session, um, but it's not live, it's just be recording. If, but if you do have any concerns with that, feel free to let us know or to uh, turn off your video. Thanks. So our speaker is going to ha uh, have a, a time until 7.30. And then uh, if there's comments or questions, uh, we have about 15 minutes, so it's a quarter to eight. And then we have a very short uh, annual meeting for our region which uh, will end at eight o'clock. Um, so just to give you a feel of the land. Uh, I'm honored to be able to introduce David Barnes, uh, who's going to speak about the Assiniboine food forest and restoring the land. 
Uh, David is an ecologist and a retired Brandon area school teacher. He is a founding member of the Assiniboine Food Forest um, and acts as chair of the board. Uh, David takes visitors on guided, regular guided nature walks along the Assiniboine River trail system in Brandon's East End. And he keeps busy with the Assiniboine Food Forest Community Orchard and the Prairie Restoration Projects. David's uh, passion include music, permaculture, and making maple syrup. And uh, so I'm pleased to welcome David to our uh, gathering and it's uh, the floor is yours, David. Oh, sorry, David, one more thing. I'll give you a hand signal that indicates 10 minutes until your closing time. I guess I can unmute myself, can't I, Carrie? It, it uh, saw the uh, mute to show up and I thought I was muted and I didn't have a chance to talk. Very well. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Ellen and Marge. Thank you for the um, beautiful thoughts and the prayer at the opening. I, I love the sweet grass and um, I almost felt like, like I should be smudging myself. But I did so non-physically. Well, you know, I'm going to ask Carrie if it's even possible. I'm going to talk. Well, you're, you've given me 45 minutes to talk. That's a long time. And, uh, you know, Carrie, I, I, I am a retired school teacher and I still do teach. So I'm going to say, I want to say to all the um, participants, get, get those questions coming. It becomes a more worth it becomes a more worthwhile experience when we share our, our thoughts. And I need to respond to your thoughts in order to build uh, a rapport with you, even through Zoom. I've not done a whole lot of Zooming, but I get the feeling that it can be rather impersonal. I've uh, spanned through the views here and I've seen a few of my um, friends from Brandon, uh, a couple of ex-students there maybe. And so I, I feel I, I'm being watched very carefully, so I better be on my best, uh, best performance here. The Assiniboine Food Forest is a, it's a charity, it's a federal charity and our, our um, raison d'etre, our purpose is to pursue uh, permaculture on our landscape of 40 acres. I'll be showing you that landscape and I've got PowerPoint slides um, that can carry us through a long, a long conversation. Um, so yes, I agree with you, Marge. There, there is, there is, a, how did you put it, a, an illness on the land. I know it. I see it. I've lived it. My life is testament to it. I've always lived on land, and I'm very blessed today. That is, I've, I've, I've been, I lived in a city, the city of Winnipeg, until I was uh, ten years old, and then I moved out of that city, and I've been living in nature ever since. That's quite a blessing to have. And my home in Brandon right now is a beautiful place in nature. And anyone of you who is anywhere near Brandon should come and visit me and visit the food forest, which is right adjacent to my property. If you got a hankering for maple syrup, you know, I'll be topping next week and cooking by the last week of March. So if you're anywhere near Brandon, you ought to figure out how to come down there and we'll do some uh, COVID safe uh, sharing. All righty, well, is there a way for you to uh, like, interrupt me and say, hey, Dave, you got five questions, and I'd like to take a pause. When you get five questions, say, let's take a pause, and then I'll deal with them. All righty. Here, I'm going to start sharing. Yeah, I'm going to start sharing screen, correct? Yes. I'm going to share my screen, and that will be the launch of this uh, PowerPoint program explaining what the food forest is all about. Well, here is a, here's a map. I'm gonna start with a map. How impersonal is that? And it will, just to show those in Western Manitoba where we are, it, it's, it's a question, you know, how to find us is, it's not the easiest thing. So here's where we are located on Rosser Avenue East. This is AFI, Assiniboine Food Forest Incorporated. And so we are surrounded by, uh, 
industrial developments to the east. And um, there we go. Our parcel is bounded by the Assiniboine River on the north. Here's Barnes's personal property right beside it. And you might know the Green Spot Nursery, which is a, a well known uh, nursery sales outlet and production outlet, uh, and Crow's General Store. Here in the east end of Brandon, the, the three of us, uh, Crow's, uh, Barnes, and Green Spot, uh, collaborate on a lot of things including our food forest. We build nature trails. We, we conduct people in nature. So we have, a, we have a, a beautiful relationship in the neighborhood. Well, I hope that helps you to find us. Um, if you look at this piece of land that is a uh, Assiniboine food forest, I want, to, I want to point out that our, the access to our project is right through Rosser Avenue here. So if you came down Rosser Avenue to the east and you passed the green spot, here's a place that you can park right in there. That used to be a forest, as you can see, five years ago, but it's a parking lot now. Isn't that the way it goes? And there's also more parking on the road outside here. But unfortunately, you, we, you know, and this road here is not open in winter. It's not really a permanent road. So, um, it's uh, our vehicle access is a bit of a challenge, but if you if you can find the green spot and you can find that parking space, you're 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 you've made it. I want to point out a little bit of the lay of the land here. For example, our trail system, our nature trails, begin at Crow's. We have an interpretive booklet. This is Crow's General Store right in there, and out of that location, you can wander your way down to the riverside and go down the bank of the river to um, the start of my property. There's a creek flowing out here and our trails wind through the forest like this and on that away. We have cut trails along the roadway here and that trail continues on into the bush and around here and to the parking area. There are so many routes that a person can walk here. So there's a nice circular nature trail that we wrote an interpretive booklet for, which you can pick up at Crow's General Store, that being a business, and uh, have yourself a guided walk with, with, uh, with a booklet as your guide. Alrighty, well, there's the lay of the land. If you looked at these ecosystems on our parcel, just, just to reflect what Marge was telling us, the land here is, there are two, there are two huge different parcels of land we have. This, these pieces here are beautiful forest. Oh my, oh my, this is the most worthy um, forest. It's, it's ancient oaks and stretches right along down the river here. This is why it's so lovely to walk here, these oak forests. Whereas the rest of this land out here is pretty much a degraded field with an invasive species. It's a, it's a difficult landscape to, to love uh, it, by visually. It's, it's, uh, it's not as beautiful as it will be. So our purpose in the food forest. Well, let's go ahead and look at those. Let's see if I can get that. Permaculture is, is what we was what we do, what we practice. Also known as ecoforestry or agroecology. So it's the science of regenerating natural ecosystems that also produce food while nurturing healthy soil and biodiversity. So we are in the business of growing habitat and putting food in it. And that's not just for people, but also for animals. Um, all of the plantings that we want to do and are practicing are natural associations. It's, this is not a tree farm. We don't believe in just taking a uniform species of trees and plunking them in the ground in a straight line and calling that a forest. Um, our system is meant to be self-sustaining and evolving. We want to plant it so that it can look after itself into the distant future. We will never use chemicals. Oh, I've got a pleasant story to tell you about that. Um, and we don't believe in plowing and tilling. We, we don't want to produce food by breaking the mother nature's soil. We don't. 
that is just, uh, you know, that's, that's contrary to how we wish to practice. All right, so there we go. Here's our vision as a corporation, a healthy community and ecological balance with a thriving environment. Oh, wouldn't that be lovely? It would be lovely. And we won't, we won't stop pursuing that vision. Our, habit, our mission is in three branches. Habitat, we want to regenerate ecosystems and also conserve them. Uh, second branch of our mission is food. We want to produce healthy food sustainably, both for humans and for wildlife. By the way, you needn't take notes here because all of this is on our website. Um, the, so much of this material can be found on our website, which I'll be showing in a bit. And our third mission is education. We want to connect students with a thriving natural environment. And we don't mean necessarily just school kids. All students, everyone who's studying is a student. We're all students here tonight. There's our website, if you'd like to note that. Uh, so much more information is on the website about the physical realities of our landscape, uh, etc. And we have a, a Facebook page and an Instagram under our primary name. All righty. Woohoo! So let's look at some of the activities that we typically produce or pursue. And um, we'll just tell it as a story. I've been hosting uh, Sunday nature walks now for this is the third year. Um, we go out on at two o'clock on Sundays, giving people time to finish up with their their church activities if they do have them or their family adult lunches. And that nature walk is just me going for a walk. That's it. And if you want to come and join in, well, more is the fun. Sometimes we'll arrange to have skis or other means of uh, propulsion, but. Normally, it's just us going for a walk because that's what I like to do. And we depart from Crow's General Store. So those in Brandon will, it, Crow's is becoming a destination that everybody knows. Well, those um, Sunday nature walks will soon be winding down, but here's just a few glimpses of nature walks. This was in back in uh, pre-COVID January of 2020. Just checking out the riverbank and talking about winter survival. We visited the Beaver Lodge across the river there and we saw the ice crystals uh, and the steam of the breath of the beavers inside. It was kind of nice and we did a little uh, gentle stomping up and down just to show the kids that man alive, you're not ever going to break into a beaver lodge. You have no chance. But we we recognize where the beavers are and we like to visit them. We have a self-guiding nature trail um, with an accompanying booklet. So, you know, you can make your way to Crows in East Brandon. You can have an experience in the food forest. Uh, here we do, we have done, and we will do again, lots of tours for groups. So education is part of our, our mission and we, want people on the land enjoying interpreting um, and this was a university group or i'm sorry a college group from acc in land and water management and basically uh my job is just take people out in the woods and spin them a tail we put on a cd event every spring it's coming right up and i get, yes i have i've adapted this there we go so normally we hold it in a community center like last year, the, these, this picture is last year. But uh, this year we're hosting a virtual event. So March 7th, we'll, um, we'll have a, a seed drop off. That's coming up you know, right away this weekend, Saturday, Sunday at Crows in the afternoon. So if you have seeds to share, that's where we'll be. And then two weeks later, we're going to uh, encourage people to come and pick up seats right at that same location after we've sorted them out and advertised what we have on Facebook. And then we'll also have a virtual event on the 20th and 21st. We'll have um, a series of videos available. All of that can be found on our Facebook page or on our website. So that's a bit of seedy Sunday. Um, as part of our work with the land, we 
we harvest. We harvest and forage. And so here is our setup for harvesting maple sap. There's a couple of the boys that are about to place the, the tank up on the platform. And uh, here we are tapping trees in late March. It's such a wonderful time. It's about to begin. So I should be out tapping within uh, three or four days. We'll be out putting taps in the trees. And there's a, there's a setup of a pail with a lid on it. This is such wonderful knowledge, you know. Um, I guess I should say, uh, I don't tap trees for for money or for profit. I I believe that the trees provide me with a gift of their sap, what I call trees blood. And th in that they give me a gift, I like to turn around and gift that syrup. I don't want to use it all for money. So there's a lot of gifting, a lot of sharing, a lot of trading. And, um, you know, a good percentage of the value of that syrup is uh, donated to the food forest as well. We've had such wonderful times uh, hosting people on the land for syrup making. Here we even branch out into the city street a little bit. Get oh, This was taken right at the green spot. Uh, last year we tapped over there. I'll be putting out, let's say, about 300 taps. I will tap pretty much 300 maple trees. And again, here's the crew having a breather during a day tapping last year. I want to speak just a little bit about our major projects. Um, those being, let's get a pen on this page. Those being the orchard, a prairie restoration, and our dream to harvest water on the landscape. So you'll see more pictures of this orchard. There's a a rectangular orchard fence here as you come along the trail in the woods and moving through the trees here there's another branch trail coming out here to the orchard it's a big deer fence and it'll keep obviously it allows us to have fruiting trees this spring we'll be decorating that orchard fence with uh, with grapes and hoping to have hoping to have grapes just climbing up the fence and decorating that uh, you'll see more about this prairie restoration going on right here. It's pretty much a circular plot. And we have, um, we're ready to seed a prairie coming up this spring. It's been several years in the preparation, but this spring we will seed the prairie. And so that will be the first of our real permacultural activities where we actually try to create a native ecosystem there with all of the local native flowers and grasses which we've spent a good time organizing and preparing. Now there is also an informal trail. I'm gonna color that trail, see how my pen works. Here's a trail that the public has used on this land for probably 25 years. In the past, it was always used by snowmobiles and quads, but we have asked uh, those vehicles to not enter anymore and, and they, they've been pretty nice. So we have added on, um, and this is a trail that I mow every summer to keep it, keep it working for, for um, visitors. The trail exits across there. And we also have a branch of it that we just created last summer, stretching along here and meeting up with that trail. So, all righty. Well, I am going to... Um, David, there's one question already. If you want to ask, are there native orchards at AFFI? It's a good idea. It's always good. Otherwise, <laughs> people are going to fall asleep. I know they are. <laughs> um, let, let me see if I can find you. Sorry, the, the question is, are there native orchards there at uh, the food forest? Yes, indeed. Let me speak to that. The native fruits that grow on their own and that can be harvested are Saskatoons. Lovely things. And as you look at the landscape out here, that's, we don't have raspberry. We do have Saskatoon. That's the only one that I've ever picked. 
here's the here's the deal with the Saskatoons. All of these bushes out here. Oh, I'm doing this now. All of, I want a pen. All of these bushes out here. All right, you know, give me a pen there. Okay. All of this and these and these bushes here. It's actually a, all of this bush out here. That's all Saskatoon, like almost 100%. There's a bit of snowberry in there. But those poor Saskatoon bushes and all of this, there's actually, there's a huge population of Saskatoon. But the deer are so omnipresent and so out of control that really they browse it down every winter to you know a height of two feet, three feet. The, 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 those shrubs can never grow to be huge. In 2014, we had a, oh, I'm practicing with my pen. We had a Saskatoon crop out of those shrubs. It was magic, you know, the conditions were just right and fruit was produced. So yes, we do have some native fruit. It's very hard, to, it's not reliable. What's going on in our, gar in our orchard right now is that we are uh, planting native fruits in amongst the apple trees. And so, um, and, and the plan certainly into the future as we reforest this landscape is to work native fruits into the plantings as well. We don't wanna just plant trees. We wanna plant shrubs in, in amongst them as well. All right, I hope I dealt with that question. Actually, it was my fault because I misread the question. The actual question was, are there orchids, native orchids there, um, not orchards? Are, oh, do you... orchids, okay. Sorry. Well, <laughs> Baseball. I, don't believe, I don't believe that we have uh, orchids. Not that I've seen. I've never found an orchid, and I have a good friend who's really mad crazy for orchids, so she would know. I doubt that we have them. <laughs> well, it was fun answering that question incorrectly. I, I got to pretend I had one. Okay, I'm going to go back one page. And then I'm going to uh, load this slide again. Because I want to show you the, the plan for the, for the pond restoration. This is when this um, development comes true. This will, this will be an actual fact, sort of a resurrection of the land. This will really bring it back to life. And that's what permaculture really wants to do. It wants to restore thriving ecosystems. Job number one in restoring land to thriving biodiversity, capture the water. Don't let any water escape. All the precipitation that falls must be retained. I'm gonna show you now an ancient, oh, come on, pen, give me a pen. There we go. This is the, this is the um, mouth of a creek right here that flowed across this landscape for probably the last 12,000 years. And if you're on, if you're visiting out here, you can see this, it's almost written on the land. It wavers a little bit as it goes down here, gets down to the end of the landscape, you know, and then poof, it runs into industrial development. And of course, the, the upstream basin of that creek is completely obliterated. So it no longer runs water as a creek except in the first half of April, usually in the first week of April, because the um, snow melt puddles up on the landscape and then follows the drainage basin of the old creek right down to the river. I've got some films of it, which I'm gonna share with you right away. It's a beautiful process, so motivating for me. So that our, our desire is to uh, Put a dam across here. In fact, we've done the soil testing in the area, and this is precisely once you're on the on the landscape, you understand that's where beavers build dams. They have, that's where beavers have built dams over the last millennia. It's such a beautiful spot to dam. And how do we know this? Well, because we have done soil testing. Now, a beaver dam at that spot would create would back up a pond of about of roughly that dimension. You can see it almost on the photograph here, but you can certainly see it on the landscape and the topographical lines agree. So this is where the pond will, if we put an earthen dam there, this is where the pond will form. And then we would want to very gently um, dig out this ditch. It's called a swale. 
and, and that's not for draining water away from anywhere. It's for capturing water, a swale. Very well. So in big rainstorms, there is a culvert coming under the railway track there. And uh, the land to the south is much higher. So everything drains towards the river. This brings a lot of water in in big storms. A swale right here would capture that water and conduct it down to our pond. And there would be a recharge of water every spring from, from snowmelt. So there's our major project. We wanna be super beavers and, and capture that water. This will um, nourish the water table. It will nourish all the forests that we're going to plant uh, around it. We wanna plant forest on most of this landscape. We would love to have our final um, orchard growth, mixed orchards up in here. Anyway, that beautiful dream uh, will hopefully uh, come to be true sometime in the near future. We're, we're working on it. Okay, what have we got next? Well, here's the creek runoff. I'm gonna show you 30 seconds. We won't play this whole tape. There's my sweetie pie. And here's some water melt. Well, it's the 24th day of March, 2020. And the water is flowing down the draw and into the Assiniboine River for the first time this spring. Just about ready to start cooking sugar, although we haven't got a sap run yet. There is the pond forming where we most decidedly want to create a pond. Following those orange stream bed markers, which mark the center of the old stream bed, Sure enough, the water has puddled up now today and it's formed right where we want to have a pond in wetland. And it's coming on down here and flowing into the river. Let's have a look at that flow. Let's come on here a little bit closer. Oh yeah, that's a pretty nice flow. five o'clock in the afternoon, basically six o'clock. You can see the water coming flowing by that ash tree uh, right here in front of us. Oh yeah, that's a good steady flow. Follow that down to the river, sweetie pie. Come on, my dogs. Oh yeah. Yeah, just, boy, that's Nothing yesterday, that's a good volume of water flowing there today. Sorry for the speed on this video. Let's follow it down the draw a little bit. Let's see if we can get a little better sense of how much water is moving. Whoa, that water is moving. Look at that go. Yeah, that's moving right along. Woohoo! The uh, video. Gets just a little bit. No, I guess I'm not. Let's see if I can. There it is. Land is certainly well flooded up there today. And this old creek bit is carrying a lot of water. Yeah, that's a lot of water moving in the creek. So beautiful. Single storm at the at the right timing can generate a lot of water on a on a drainage basin, and once the drainage basin begins to hold water again, it will um, reestablish age-old patterns in the soil, and forest will regrow quite quite vigorously from that existence of a, a pond up there. Wow. 
lot of water moving. Well, there we go. Let's see if I can play this again. Okay. No, no, no. We go ahead now. Well, I've just checked the time, so I think I've got about 15 minutes left. I better speed myself up a little bit. Here's the way the engineer's drawings look a dam and a, a sculpted pond. There is a certain amount of excavation going on here. The overall depth of our pond, we hope would be about 10 feet. Those are nesting islands for waterfowl. Such a wonderful development. We'll dream that one up with to reality. And there was our maple syrup crop last year. Maple syrup is so much fun. Why don't you come on and visit? If people come from out of town, I always gift them syrup. I don't make them pay. We've always held maple syrup tours, and this year we won't, as in last year. It's a sad thing to not have family groups come and visit, but there's the setup. There's the woodshed and the, and the sugar shack and a pail on the tree. We do harvest nettle in the month of May, and if you are around, you should. I do invite you to come and check it out. Uh, stinging nettle is not a native plant. It is a European plant, but it's everywhere along the Assiniboine Valley these days. And it is indeed a very nutritious green. Um, you should come and get some in the month of May. We host workshops all the time. This one was with the college in, in um, thermophilic compost production. So there were the students and myself in the back, and here's the compost that we produced. Oh, and in the morning sun at another angle, you can see the steam coming off the compost. That was a pretty nice little, little project. We have hosted a trees blood, a spring festival for many years, 16 years here, although it's not been hosted by the food forest for 16 years, but and there we are uh, decorating our shipping container, which is our office and our storage site uh, in uh, 2019. We've hosted weddings on the landscape. There's one of our board members on her wedding day. Oh my goodness, what a day it was. But we won't do that this year, not that I'm aware. Uh, we will be planting in that orchard, so there will be opportunities. That is going to be coming up in May and June, probably again in September. There you can see the deer fence in the orchard. Without that fence, there wouldn't be orchard fruits. Uh, but things are fruiting this year. We planted this in 2017, and we are now on the verge of collecting harvests. It'll be soon. Many school groups and adventure camps uh, would come out. This was um, uh, from Mennonite Brethren, uh, a church in Brandon, and they host a week-long gathering every July. Ah, uh, we missed them last year, and I think we'll miss them again this year. If you walk the food forest trails, you will see these tree tubes. So this has been a very unique initiative for how to protect trees from deer. Each one of these tubes is covering, is placed upon a small sapling tree, a natural tree, not, not anything we planted. And you can see all these trees, down, uh, um, tubes down at the far end. They're all along this trail. We've got over 120 of them out and another 300 to go this year. What happens is that the trees grow protected inside the tubes and they get to the top. Here it is by September of last year. Uh, the prior slide, we, we put the tubes in place in September, 2019. Here they are in September of 2020. Well, that sapling tree got going and grew right up the top of the tube. Well, Later in September, the deer munched this all off, it's true. But they only do their browsing in fall, in May, June, July. So that tree has got a bud right up near the top today. And when the season, growing season starts, he'll have a sprint and he'll get himself going upwards. And hopefully the tip gets up a couple feet beyond the reach of the deer. And so we hope. These things apparently work. I mean, they're designed in Europe and they've been tested all around the world. 
One of the things that we are very passionate and happy to be doing is elder storytelling and sharing with the local um, First Nations. Um, we had, I think we had Dakota elders. Yes, we had a Dakota elder. We had Ojibwe elders um, telling tales about, uh, well, just about life. And what a beautiful day that one was. We look forward to more of that. We have uh, put orchard uh, bird boxes out and here was one of our most famous uh, guests uh, using the housing she rented or he rented for a summer. And here are the babies that were inside such lovely things bluebirds are. Uh, another um, regular uh, activity is we tour around for doors open Brandon which is a, a day when or a weekend when people can visit anywhere almost that they like and we put on tours. I, I don't think we're planning them this summer. We'll see. I want to tell you just a little bit of a tale about our prairie restoration project. It's been a summer of extremely busy activity. This was all this last summer, 2020. First, we brought the Brandon Fire Department in and they performed a burn on May 21st. There is the prairie, or there's all the invasive grass burning up. And here's what it looked like when that was done. We did a bit of mowing for a couple of weeks and then we brought a friend in, organic farmers, um, Pat and Larry Pollock brought their disker. Well, if, if you're a farmer, you can see the discs and diskers basically chop up the top seven inches of turf and flip it over on itself. Essentially, really ripping it and turning it over. Here's what it looked like two weeks later. And then we set about gathering up all those dried out rhizomes of invasive grass. We want this uh, path completely black in order to plant it with native uh, species. So the first thing we tried was dragging a small harrow. That proved to be quite crazy. It simply clogged up the harrows. So instead we set about doing it with pitchforks and wheelbarrows. Here's my dog and four grandchildren slaving away oh they slaved on that patch and uh, here's another one here jose and boy i'll tell you look at him with that pitchfork that's a man who knows how to do country work well after a week we had most of the rhizomes off here you can see the piles of them oh, grab me a pen look at these piles of rhizomes over here i swear there are oh probably a hundred oh, hundreds of pounds of rhizomes that we have taken off and we just dump them in piles to compost. So next method we used was the quad and harrow. So, so after that, we dragged the harrows regularly across that. Uh, here's my buddy Steven doing that uh, with some weight on the harrows and week by week, that landscape just got blacker and blacker. You can see in this picture here that there are certainly uh, thistles that are still threatening to bother, you know, and we had to go around and dig out those thistles with pitchfork, with um, garden forks and thistle busters. And mm, it was lots of work, lots of work. But at the end of the summer, I'm happy to say with one last touch uh, of this cultivating rig owned by my friend Wayne Chupka, we... I think polished off the weeds. We have actually turned the patch black and we don't believe there's a weed in it. Let's see how much time have I got. 22, I'm gonna carry right on moving. So next summer is planting. We'll be planting this in May or June, early June or late May. And boy, there will be opportunities to integrate with us. So if you're keen on volunteering, this is gonna be the finest uh, butterfly garden in Brandon. That's an acre and it's going to be magic. We will have uh, bergamot. These are some of the seeds that we've collected ourselves. This is local flowers. We'll have bergamot in it. We'll certainly have yarrow in it. Uh, these are medicinal uh, native plants as well. The echinacea that's grown on the trails. We'll have that in it. Also the gaylardia. Every one of these seeds we have we have harvested ourselves and the narrow leaf sunflower that produces in, in one year. So it should give us color this summer. We also have a legacy tree program, which uh, it, when people wish to gift us trees, we accept uh, the gift of a tree and we'll look after it and, and tag it. And 
And um, here's one of our tree planting crews. Happy people with dirty hands, with dirty fingernails. Okay. A quick uh, summary of what's going to be going on in the future. Uh, we will be operating nature trails. We definitely will. We are going to be planting trees. This is a handsome patch of oaks uh, at my neighbor's, but uh, we don't plant them that big, but we'll get them growing that big. We'll be doing Sunday nature walks. And these are very impromptu. And so there are no two walks are ever the same. We've got a lot of orchard work to do this uh, summer. So that's going to be advertised and it's going to be giving us a lot of pleasure. This community orchard, by the way, is not for us. It's not for profit. It's for the community. And every fruit that we make is going to be given, not sold. And at the end of the, of the show, I'm just leaving some openings for possible possibilities. Astronomy evenings is something that we've tried. We've given it the first test and uh, we're going to be happy to go forward with that into the future. So I think I'm going to stop sharing. There, it's 724. <laughs> oh, look at how many I put to sleep. Let's have a look. Yeah. No, I was oh, there's a few sleeping. Oh, I can see sleepers out there. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, there's Brittany. Oh, my goodness. I should have been more. We, we do have a few questions, David, that came in. If you have time to take a few questions. Happily. Sure. So the first one you might have already answered because it, it was came early on. And I think you did talk about this, but it's a, it asks, are your seeds for prairie all indigenous to the land? Are the seed? Yeah. Uh, well, the answer is yes. And it, it, they have been har Some of them have been harvested a, a little bit further out than our plot. So we have a we have a gift uh, uh, of seed from from Shiloh, from the Shiloh Ranges which is a big mixed grass prairie. We have a gift of seed that was harvested along highway two, and it's mostly big blue stem. Um, you know, and we have, but for the most part, the seeds have, have, well, they've all been collected in Manitoba and pretty near to us. Yep. Yeah, it's local indigenous. Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah. There's also a couple of questions that came in about the pond. Um, yeah. One of them has to do with whether you would, would you dig the, out the pond area to make it deeper? Is that part of the plan? Um, and the other question was, what is holding the process up regarding the pond? I'm assuming meaning what is, what's keeping you from doing it, but Julie, you can clarify if that's what you meant. Right. Um, yes, there would be excavation involved. Um, the construction of a mud wall, which, you know, a bunch of, friends could do in a weekend. We could just go take trucks and dump soil on there. If we just mounded up um, soil across the, the opening, we would get five feet of water just for doing that. And so we, in our um, studies, and we've actually spent over $17,000 engaging environmental engineers to study this. And so if you do a gentle excavation, so therefore the pond itself would have gently excavated another five feet down for a total of about 10 feet deep in the pond. Yes, so there is a bit of excavation. All of this is based on a permaculture science, um, which was originated by a, a, an Austrian man by the name of Sepp Holzer. There the fellow you should look up, Sepp Holzer, H-O-L-Z-E-R. Um, I actually studied lake building with Sepp on his last North American tour. We actually took our course with this guy and how to build lakes. So um, he, he's, a, he's a magician, that one. The final question is, what's holding us up? Well, I guess you'd say the thing that's holding us up is that it's not our land. So we need to proceed in, in community with our administrative team. And so I'm, I'm, that's not blaming or that's not saying there's, you know, that somebody has, has uh, ill intentions. But, you know, I think, and, and it's been very easy to understand that the that administration, both city and province, that have things to say about our projects, 
they, they're they necessarily cautious. This is a reasonable thing. You don't want to go handing off your landscape to some bunch of wackos and have things go blind and wrong. So, you know, we, we, we really dream that this summer is the summer that we're going to be allowed to go fundraise. That's what we hope to do. Just go fundraising and let the details work themselves out. Makes sense. Um, that answers, that's a couple of people asked about so who owns the land um, and are land use permits required? Yes, the city owns the land. Okay. And uh, Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation owns a, uh, holds a conservation easement on mm -hmm. the land. So there is a MHHC authority and a civic authority. Uh, we are given a lease. So we, we have a lease on the land, which allows us to manage things. And of course, pay the insurance too. We get to spend enough money on the insurance, I'll tell you. But, um, you know, yeah, we don't want to do this. Yeah, we have to convince people. So we're on it. Excellent. Thanks. Um, someone asked also about the funding. Um, where is the funding coming from for the work that you're doing on the site? Well, thank you for that question. I, I want to start off by saying our very first seed funding, you know who it came from? David Suzuki, of all things. Whoa. It was 2013? 13. Oh, when was David Suzuki in town in Brandon? In fact, he was brought to Winnipeg for a special date. It was the fall of an election year, a federal election, 13 or 14. Yeah, 14. And um, so David Suzuki was speaking in Winnipeg. We scored him. We just scored him in Brandon. He came out and gave a motivational speech to the community and gave us all the fees. So that was like a $5,000 gift. But our money is given. We get it in memberships. We get it in donations. We get it in syrup sales. Um, you know, we, we, we tend to be reasonably attractive to donors. And so we're surviving on donations. Um, another person asks, will, the, uh, will this area still flood if the river overflows in flood conditions? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, this area will flood. It has flooded uh, twice in this decade, in 11 and 14. Yes, it'll flood. And, you know, pretend you were beavers and that was your dam. Now, what would a flood do? Would a flood uh, cause you to abandon the landscape and have everything ruined? Well, not at all. In fact, um, although floods are famous in Brandon for having aggressive tendencies, and they certainly do that at the Riverbank Discovery Center. You know, it comes underneath the 18th Street Bridge and it just attacks city buildings. It's awful. Uh, but in our, in our position, the river is more tangential to us. The massive currents don't attack our dam. So it's really more like a, the state of a, a calm lake where this development is. And so the water comes up and then the water goes down. We see, see it as a very beautiful possibility that a lot of the biota out of the Assiniboine River is gonna come and try and habitate the pond. So we'll maybe get crayfish in there. We could have stickleback in there. It's, a, it's lovely to think of, the, of what a flood will bring. So really, as, as an ecologist, I've got to say that floods by and large are gifts. They're natural gifts. They're not, they're, they're not necessarily tragedy. The tragedy of the modern flood is because we live in industrial life, which is causing climate change. And then we also, you know, voraciously attack uh, wetlands so that we have no natural sponges to absorb flood water anymore. But floods are ecological gifts. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Thanks, David. There's um, uh, one person asked a bit about uh, how are you recognizing the original people on the land um, are there plans to uh, gift the land to the Indigenous people or anything related, to, any thoughts on that? Such an important question. We wrestle with it. We are collaborating with, uh, with Jason Gobey and with Frank Tashin, local authorities, Krista Jarley of the college. We are having speakers regularly. We always ask for blessings, but it's something that we need to, oh, if we could only have uh, an indigenous person on our board of governance that would be pretty that would be pretty sweet but we are mindful and um, we seek guidance we need guidance it feels like a natural pursuit for us to to collaborate 
with First Nations. And wouldn't it be lovely to gift the land? It's just not ours to gift. You know, it would be magic. There's uh, another question about what other animals have you seen on the land besides deer and beaver? Yeah. Oh, there's a tail. Well, we see we see the uh, the jackrabbit uh, um, daily. We see lots of uh, red squirrels. We've got porcupine and skunk, and we've got oh weasel and mink galore. We have otter, beaver, um, marmots, um, woodchucks, badger, coyote, and fox. Lots of coyote and fox. That's because I have dogs. I know this because my dogs cannot ignore the smell of a coyote or a fox. They go crazy for them. And of course, then we have to run around after them. And yes, indeed, the large ungulates do pay a visit once in a while. We see a moose once a summer. I swear, a moose comes through once a summer. He's always heading east down the river valley. Now that'll be, you know, a young animal out of Riding Mountain, likely. Uh, seen a, actually, we have so many deer. I've actually saw a mule, deer, a mule deer one time, which is a little bit out of range. So some lovely wildlife, lots of birds, of course, many birds. That's all the um, questions that have come in, unless someone else has, um, wants to add something else in the chat, or we can also just text and unmute if you want to. Tommy wants to make a comment. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, when I first seen your face, I asked Avon, hey, you know, I know that person for some place. <laughs> I'm talking about the beard fella. And then okay. while he kept talking, then it came to my mind. It's a retired doctor that came to Grassy and worked for Grassy for a period of five years, I think, and he passed away again. Uh -huh. And the reason why we uh, had him work for Grassy is because he knew quite a bit about pollution, you know, that mercury thing. And he did a lot of work. He, uh, uh, he uh, used to walk across the lake to go and see people that were sick. Uh -huh. I don't see doctors do that anymore. But you've seen in pictures. Well, I'm happy to have such a... Uh, doppelganger. I, I uh, you know, I thought you might proceed to say that you came from Saging First Nation because I, I taught at Saging First Nation for three years in the '70s, so I still, I still think very fondly of my time up there. I've also met in chat with uh, a Chinese, you know, a Japanese friend. Was he Chinese? David Suzuki. Japanese. Japanese. Japanese, Japanese, yeah. In the reserve a few times. Oh, well. He, he said his uh, corporation oh, will be there for Grassy if they ever needed money to. to uh, Are you to, from Grassy? Yes, but I wasn't raised and born there. I oh, live in Kenora called Ojaskonigam. It's a uh, rat village. Ojaskonigam, yeah, Ojaskonigam, yeah. I wasn't too good of a father, I guess, or a husband. So my wife kicked me out of the house with the kids. So I, the kids stayed here and I stayed behind with the kids. And I'm still living here. <laughs> but we still talk to each other and stuff like that. But anyways, what I wanted to ask you, you've got quite a, quite a place there. And I, I get kind of confused because you showed quite a bit of land and where you're where you're a owner of one land. And what gets me is that the, the first, when, you, when we uh, heard the open about uh, Treaty 1 and Treaty 2, land that was preoccupied by the uh, Sioux and the uh, Ojibwe's and whatever Crees, you know, uh, <laughs> I still feel kind of left out by having you shown us the, the maps in the area. That's quite a land that's been already occupied by houses and whatnot, you know. There's not really too much growth for any uh, future uh, uh, creation, what the creator made for the 
Like, what struck you when you were showing about the uh, water that run away through through the uh, your place? And I was telling the rest of the uh, Anishinaabe people that we have here, wouldn't that be nice, you know, if he could get some help and cultivate that area a little more to make it maybe about in some some places maybe six feet to about three feet, something like that. And, you know, with the help of uh, Native people, the, the Dakota, uh, Cree, Ojibwe, even Eskimo people, you know, for uh, plants for you to grow. Because uh, we live off the land and we uh, have a lot of knowledge of uh, uh, medicine plants. And we're thinking maybe if we can somehow uh, get enough people that are interested like you are and we have a lot of wonder uh, of our own people especially young people that are not coming on they want to go back because there's a lot of work to be done to regenerate what we seem to have lost already through pollution and uh, i guess economics they call it yeah habitat destruction yes the thing that uh, i believe we agreed agreed upon right here is to see whether you can start growing uh, what we call weekend. Now, I don't know how the Dakota calls, calls that. It's a medicine that is good for your stomach, a medicine that's good for your brain, that's your that's hearing, that's eyesight, that's and that's also your uh, immune system. Okay. It gives, it gives the, the heart much more power and strength to uh, pump medicine down to your feet and pump it back up again. And you know, older people like myself <laughs> and a few others I was telling you, that's where we seem to start losing our uh, our youth and our energies through our feet because we're stepping on our vital organs. It's, it's at the bottom of our feet. I, I can show you if you see <laughs> it. And that's where your your heart is, your, your kidneys, your, everything, all your major organs are there. And we feel that is why the older the person gets, regardless whether it's a white man or Indian or, I don't like using the word Indian, I like using the word Anishinaabe because the word, one one, one of my friends, good friends of mine, white people say, I, I see that you really don't like the word Indian, why? And I said, well, it's a rejection from society. I said, mm -hmm. they, they don't like, they don't like the word Indian. And the the character that is uh, embedded in the Anishinaabe because of that. It's, it, it's really uh, a no-no for a lot of people. But this is the thing that that could happen if you, we can, we can, you know, like you mentioned uh, Suzuki, he said he would, he would help us with, you know, some money like that. If we can get together and, and make a plan out of the world and now we can get some some uh, weekend to be uh, transit in your area because right now where we live, pollution is getting so bad that our medicine plants, you know, they don't, they don't seem to be as, uh, as uh, uh, potential, I guess I, I, I would say. They're not as strong as, as it would be. Well, I think, um, I think collaborating, um is what what we need to do all, all over the world in this group the more that we collaborate together the more that we find opportunities to be together and share the better we get so i certainly uh, would w welcome having um, visitors come to my place and this food forest land and and touring folks around there is kind of that's kind of like what i do day by day <laughs> so please do come and visit it and um and learn from the land. Just to say also, um, David, that there's a lot of uh, comments coming in from in the chat about uh, appreciation for what you shared. And um, that was very fascinating and uh, that they'll hope they'll be able to visit sometime, so. Yes, okay. So thanks so much. Well, 26 comments on the chat. Oh yeah. Oh, nice. 
I also wanted to uh, add my thank you for the presentation. I certainly enjoyed what you shared with us and you're doing a, a really wonderful job. And I hope you get your, your pond set up soon and uh, get your orchard growing. And I'd like to come by and see your, your maple, cooking maple sometime. Yeah. I, uh, well, I live right. close to Brandon. I know, and well, you were introduced as Dakota Sioux Valley, so you you so you got to come, Marge. Yes, you I will. Take some home. Mm hmm. Yeah, because it's after all, it's your, it's the people of the land that that taught, you know, the colonials, all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes, that, uh, the collaboration and the and the assisting each other to survive, and yes, now we can go back to sharing and. I know, and we have so and many collaborating again. Challenges for mm -hmm. people now. So many challenges. Yes, yes. I want to well, thank Dave uh, very much. We, I really appreciated uh, the information, and uh, I have had a forty tree uh, apple tree orchard when I was on the farm in uh, in uh, Saskatchewan, and. Uh, used uh, 51 varieties of apple trees from the University of Saskatchewan, which you may wow. know about, that are yes, for this region. Yeah. That's a good fruit center, U of S. Oh boy, yeah. a lot comes out of there. Yeah. But I will uh, have to move us into our annual meeting. I'm sorry because we're having a very good discussion and uh, hope to have you back again. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Time soon, yeah. All right. Um, I uh, just would officially like to open the annual meeting for the Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario uh, Kairos region. And um, I do think that uh, Ellen Gross, our, our uh, treasurer, is trying to phone in. Is there no, I have, pho I have phoned in. Oh, good. Okay. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been listening. <laughs> So uh, I want to welcome everybody to the annual meeting. Uh, and uh, our, our agenda is very quick. Uh, and uh, so we have minutes from 2019. Uh, we have a financial report. We have a nominations report. And we have comments or questions um, uh, and adjournment. So we're going to try and do that all in 15 minutes if we can. <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> Ellen. Excuse me, Ellen. Do you have someone taking minutes? No, I don't. I was just going to ask if somebody would take. I, I can't volunteer, but I know that you would want that. Yeah. Linda, where are you? I think she's <laughs> had to leave. I think Brandon is not cooperating. So, Harry, do you want to take minutes? <laughs> oh, Debbie? I, I could if you like. Okay, that would be great. Um, Carrie, did we circulate any of the minutes or the financial statement, or did you find a way to do that? Or um, Well, I, I didn't find a way easily to do that, but I couldn't. I can post them. I can uh, share the screen so people can see them. That would work. Okay. So I do... Um, if you want to put the, I can put the um, minutes up. The minutes up, yeah. Um, did you want to say anything about them? Uh, I was wondering if we wanted to read them or just highlight some stuff. Um, Feel free. Okay, um, these are minutes from our annual meeting on October 18th and 19th, uh, 2019. Um, we held our uh, fall gathering at St. John's Presbyterian Church, and uh, we were walking softly uh, and talking about the doctrine of discovery, impacts on land, food, and relations. On Friday evening, we had a, a a blanket exercise on, uh, on um, Indigenous food sovereignty with uh, Alison Cox and her family members, which was quite a intensive blanket exercise, but also very, very informative. We talked about the 
uh, free Na uh, First Nations uh, family advocate, as well as migrant workers and the land, and also environment and the care of the land. So you can tell from um, uh, our um, our interest as a regional uh, group, a uh, lot of uh, discussion around the, how the doctrine of discovery has impacted uh, Indigenous people as well as white people and people of color uh, and the long-term effect of that and the fact that we're still in colonization mode. Um, we uh, had a brief report from myself. Ellen Gross presented a financial report for September 1st, 2018 to the August 2019. That's our financial year. And uh, that financial report was presented and carried and also a proposed budget for 2019 and 2020 was approved. Um, uh, Karen Crow presented nomination report. Um, the present uh, members of the coordinating committee uh, remain in place. Uh, Ellen Wood will continue as regional rep and chairperson for one year. And Ellen Gross will continue as treasurer for one year. Mary Lamontry will continue as communication liaison. And uh, at the time we were looking for a vice chairperson and a secretary. Uh, we did open nominations to the floor, none came forward. And we moved that nominations report. Um, uh, there was a thank you for uh, members of Kairos and those who were visiting us uh, at the meeting. And uh, just uh, leading into today, uh, uh, 2020, as you know, has been an unusual year for all of us. And uh, so our uh, coordinating committee and uh, some of our groups uh, were kind of late in starting in 2020. But we've, um, through the thick and thin of it, we've continued uh, many campaigns throughout 2020 and uh, leading into 2021. And we've uh, mastered the art of uh, webinars and Zoom. And uh, so I, th I think 2021 will be a really interesting year. And thank uh, all the members of the coordinating committee uh, members of the various groups uh, across our region, as well as um, the national staff from Kairos um, and volunteers at events that we have, um, donations of uh, money. Um, just uh, it's amazing organization to be part of. And as we spend more time together and, and invite more people into the, into the group uh, and invite and partner with other like-minded groups. Um, we're, we, we're moving along into our presence in the, in the region. Uh, so having said that, I'll ask Ellen if she would uh, present the financial statement for um, August 31st, 2019 to August 31st, 2020. Okay, Does do people have the financial statement in front of them or should I just read it out? I don't, we don't have it in front of us. Okay, well, our income for the year was, we got $1,000 from National, Kairos National, and we had $475 coming in from the AGM. The expenses for the AGM were 3270 no, yeah, Three thousand two hundred and seventy-eight eighty-eight, and then we made a donation. And I can't. Uh, I have the check number, but unfortunately, there's no name beside it, and I haven't been able to find it. But I have a feeling it was a donation to um, the migrant workers. Yeah, I think it was temporary yeah. foreign workers. What's that? Uh, temporary um, foreign workers. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we had a total of income of 1475 total expenses of 3478.88 which left us with a minus position of 
but we had a forward balance from August 31st, 2019 for 2956.27, which left uh, $952.39 in our checking account. And we have still have money in a savings account, which is getting <laughs> very little interest, but it's 372.61. So we have funds of to- totaling $1,325. Would uh, you like to move that report, Ellen? Yes, I'll move the acceptance of that report, of the financial report. And is there a seconder? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Karen? No, 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 I'm fine. Thank you. Any discussion from anyone? All those in favor of receiving the financial report? I'm not sure how we're going to do this, but anyway. <laughs> well, I can't see anything, so I don't know. <laughs> I'll suggest I'm just on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it might be easier to ask if there's any objections. <laughs> okay. Are there any objections? Uh, hearing none, I'll say that that motion is carried then. Um, where's my agenda here? Uh, nominations from Karen. Crow. Can't hear you, Karen. Okay, hi. It, this is Karen. Am I coming through? Yep. Yep. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's been my pleasure to again uh, be the person to find people who are wanting to uh, provide their assistance to, to to Kairos. As you can see, here is the dominating committee. Uh, I'm going to very briefly uh, tell you that um, and, and ask, I think, for two, two motions uh, for the communications person, Mary Lamatra, and for Alan Gross. They are, have both served on Kairos Cloco for a few years and are willing to let their names stand again. I would ask them that is, is there anyone? Uh, that was would like to uh, add their name to that, or are, will we accept their names as uh, as communications and treasurer? Are there any nominations uh, for the position of treasurer or communications liaison? Hearing none, I would declare that that they are approved. Right. And then moving on then to uh, to our elect other elected position, and that being one of secretary is uh, Pastor Jennifer Marlor, uh, and vice chair Carrie Harvey, Stacey and Harvey, and uh, chair uh, Dominique is Bree Wallagroski. And I'm going to very quickly tell you that I'm so, we're so very pleased that we have a secretary has come on. Board. Uh, she's an evangel- evangelical Lutheran minister, and she's coming on board to, to be a secretary, and that's a thankless job, but she is willing to do it. Uh, moving on to Kairos, or to, uh, to Perry, he's a settler Mennonite, lived and worked in Winnipeg as a guest in Treaty One Territory. He works as the coordinator at the Indigenous Neighbors Program of the Mennonite Central Committee, and he is aiming to facilitate relations between Indigenous and under Indigenous people. Kerry has worked with Kairos uh, for a few years now and has been just an exemplary uh, uh, person to be a part of our, our COCO group. Um, Bree, uh, who has agreed to let her name stand for chair, is a writer, facilitator, and community organizer who's been active in Kairos, G's Magazine, World Student Christian Federation and other faith-based social justice organizations for over a decade. She is passionate about social equity and in creating a world-based community and justice. Uh, I would like to make a motion then that we accept the three unless there is any further nominations from the floor or from the wherever it's coming from. (laughs) Let's, let's ask if there's further nominations for the position of chair, vice chair, and secretary. I will just say that there are two people that raised their hands, Mary McNerney and uh, Catherine 
Did you want to say something, either of you? No, I was just voting yay. Okay. <laughs> just <laughs> want to make sure you are nominating somebody. I move I'm nominations ready. close. Okay. Uh, I think that being said, then we we will accept the that the nominations are closed and accept the chair, vice chair, and truth and secretary position as being Bree, Carrie, and Jennifer. Thank you for your help with this. And moving on to, of course, Ellen Wood will be the past chair. Um, and speaking of Ellen Wood, she's not going to get away real fast because I've got a few <laughs> words to say about this lady. So Ellen emerged onto the Cairo scene about six years ago. She spent two years as Coco Vice Chair and has served almost three years as chair. She's committed to Kairos and has shown great leadership and strength and tactfulness when the going sometimes gets challenging. She's been a steady hand on the tiller. I'm a, I'm a sailor, so I can say that. And has encouraged and guided the work of Manitoba, Northwest Ontario Kairos. Ellen, we know you won't be far away when we need to call on you, but we'll give you a break for a couple of months. So in the meantime, we hope that you will enjoy <laughs> yes. Yeah. What? <laughs> I've never done this before. This is more. <laughs> A virtual. And I will be. I'll be bringing out it out to you in Stonewall, and and from all of us, we wish you well, and we thank you all from the bottom of our hearts as Coco members and Kairos members of this region for all the hard work you have done. You've, you've been a wonderful chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. I very much appreciate, uh, enjoyed the, uh, and appreciated the people I've worked with, uh, not only within the Kairos organization and especially within our region. And I've enjoyed meeting other groups and, uh, and working with them on various campaigns that Kairos has been involved in and sometimes not even involved in. So uh, I'm looking forward to a break and uh, I do wish Bree and Carrie and Ellen, and Jennifer, Mary uh, and Karen uh, uh, good work in 2021 and uh, we'll I'll still be available as Karen says. So thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Are there any uh, other uh, comments that people would like to ask or questions? I, I would like to just say to you that if I can, uh, I am going to offer you Sweetgrass, Ellen. Um, this is a gift from me to you. Oh, and okay. Sweetgrass, as you know, cannot be purchased. It has to be gifted. And I gift this to you. Well, thank you. Yeah. I've enjoyed working with Karen. She's been a steady hand and uh, uh, as well as the community representatives on the coordinating committee and also people who are part of our groups. And uh, I have just really enjoyed working with so many people. Um, so thank you. Um, I'll ask again if, if there's any uh, comments or questions. Is that the end of the business agenda? It, I was just going to ask for a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so when you finished with your nominating committee, you were finished. Yeah. Yeah, that was moved, really seconded, or approved. Actually, just consensus. Shannon, did you want to say something? I did. I just uh, would add my thanks and appreciation for your years of service, Ellen, in that chair role, and also. Uh, to Brie, who's stepping up. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know you a bit more and uh, working together. And I guess for those on the call who don't know, um, I'm Shannon Neufeld and I'm the uh, staff liaison to the regional groups. And so I work quite closely with the regional representatives or the chairs of the coordinating committees. Um, and I, I just want to express my appreciation to the planners of this year's annual gathering, these four events, and uh, for all of you for coming out and being part of this event. 
just add my, my personal gratitude. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Shannon. Um, do I have a motion for adjournment of this annual meeting? I'll move adjournment. Okay, and I don't think I'll we- second that. All right, Karen. Uh, is that carried? Any, any opposed? Okay. Uh, I want to thank Marge, our elder, and I also want to thank uh, uh, elders who have joined us from Kenora, and uh, thank you for taking the time to be part of discussion and, and, the, and the presentation. Um, just to remind people that March 11th, next, next Thursday, um, our speaker are going to talk about investigating unmarked grave sites and burial grounds at the Brandon Residential School site. And uh, two speakers who will speak to that. And we're looking forward to that. So um, until next week, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good night. you. Bye. Excellent. Excellent. Who's the speaker next week, Ellen? It'll be Catherine Nichols and uh, Damon Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs>